Hey guys, I'm Roger from Roger's Rigs. The video you're about to watch is a class, a seminar that I give uh, at a bunch of different sportsman shows. Uh, the, the quality is, is good enough to get the idea of what's going on. It gets into the, a lot of the details of what I've discovered over about 25 years of, of trying to figure out perch. Some of the science behind it, some of the lures behind it, the actual movements we go to, where to find them in lakes. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to check it out. If you like uh, some of the things that we're using here, I talk about using chain jigs, I talk about using fly rigs and stuff. Uh, my wife, my friends and I actually tie some of these things, make these lures, and we sell them on a website called rogersrigs.com. But uh, sit back and enjoy, and thank you for watching. And, uh, I, I've been obsessed with ice fishing. I was thinking about it last night. I, I lived, uh, our house had uh, the uh, V-joint flooring, and there was a knot missing in my room, and I always wanted to drop a line down through that knot hole, and it went right over the kitchen table, and I wanted to see what I could catch from, from upstairs to downstairs. There was something about fishing through a hole that just always got me excited. But I didn't know nothing about how to do it. Like, my father was a really good beaver trapper, and he'd take me ice fishing, but unless there was a beaver involved, he really wasn't going to add anything to how to do it. And uh, I got some books, and I got a friend who also didn't know how to fish. And we went out for two years and caught nothing. <laughs> but we kept going, because well, it was too cool. Like, we, we were doing everything wrong. We had, like, rubber minnows on the tip-up, and, and jigging with spinners, and, and I learned like if you drop eggshells down through the hole, you can watch the eggshells settle to the bottom. You can see to the bottom and start to learn stuff. I had this little stupid rubber doodad. I'm laying there, I'm about 14 years old, watching that rubber doodad. And this perk zoomed in from the side and bit that thing. And I caught him. His first fish in two years. And I was I was hooked from then on. Like all I wanted to do was try to duplicate that. Which, uh, which we eventually figured out how to make that happen. So what I want to talk about today, like, it's funny how ice, or particular perch fishing is. Like, it's tiny little details that make a difference between catching a lot of fish or catching no fish at all. Uh, that kind of continued that story. So I, got, I was 16 years old, got my driver's license, and the, I lived in Brant Lake, but the place to fish for perch was in Bowacky Bay up in Lake Champlain. That was, you know, commercial fishermen were catching perch by the buckets up there. Uh, so I, my buddy Kenny's here today. We used to... I'd pick him up in the morning with his brothers and everything, and we would go up to Bowaggy Bay at, like, daylight, and we would catch perch until dark, and then I would fillet perch till 2 o'clock in the morning, and I'd go to sleep at night seeing my bobber in the hole going boink, 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 and get up and do it again the next day. It was So we did the same thing over and over and over again. We got good at it, but I thought, I know how to, I know how to catch perch, and it turns out that what I knew in that lake wasn't exactly the thing to do in every leg. So I want to go through, I'm going to go through where, when, how, and, and why to jig perch. So to kind of start, like, where you fish is, is really key. Uh, I would like to say, like, if you, one of the biggest things, if you, uh, if you go to a bait shop and talk about, you know, where are people catching fish, they'll at least give you some sort of a clue. If you go online, and there's a, a site called iceshanty.com where people post what they've been catching today and they give some information. Usually it's limited. Sometimes they might try to just uh, send you off in the wrong bay or something. But most of the time, you're going to get at least a clue. Like guys are fishing over here and they're catching this. And they'll usually start giving details of what they're using for lures. And that's a good way to get started. I mean, I'd say, like, especially to get started, follow the crowds. There's a region, there's a crowd of people there It's because there's there's a crowd of fish underneath there. And you want to learn from that. But So I'll go out on a lake. I've never been out before. I see a crowd of people. I, there's another real good trick of uh, tracking on the ice. Uh, you can see somebody's been fishing ahead of you and they've been drilling a hole. They drill another hole. You see they're kind of froze over. They drill another hole. And then they drill this hole. And then they drill the hole here and here and here and here. Well, they were searching for perch, and then they caught one or two here, and then they started bouncing around. You can save a whole bunch of time if you go out and just see a bunch in a row, walk right over that bunch in a row, hit this spot here, and start fishing that, and start thinking about what the elements are that's good about that. Is it a weed bottom? What's the depth you got there? Uh, 
and that can what you want to do really to get so you're catching them consistently start where the crowds are figure out what the elements are that are holding fish there and then look for those elements somewhere else in the lake where there isn't quite as many people sometimes in the summer you want to do that in your boat just look around you're like i need to find those leafy weeds in about 14 feet of water that's going to be the key and you find those spots if you get this Naviotics app on your phone, you can download it for free or you can pay like 50 bucks for a fancier one. It has a topographic uh, uh, map of every lake in North America. And it has GPS location of where you are. It's amazing that you can be walking on the ice and say, okay, I'm walking up on a hump. There's about a three foot elevation right here. And you start catching fish there and then you put a little waypoint on there so you can go back to it. In the summer, if you find those spots, you can kind of sink in those waypoints. That is an amazing thing. Like the, a bunch of the fish that I've caught on these videos here, we caught over a thousand perch on a spot a little bit bigger than this room. And I found it because it was a perch bed and it had perch almost everywhere, the grass bottom in Lake George. But there was this little bit of a sunken island right there. And there's something about that three foot more elevation in that spot. And I was able to, like, the first, I'd never fished that lake before, or that portion of the lake before. I just, yeah, better try right here. I only drilled two holes and caught 50 perch each and went home. Uh, so the Navionics is a real good key. Follow in the crowds. Check out that um, iShanty.com. It's a good way to get started. And that'll get you, like, that'll get you somewhere close to on the right where, which is important. Just as important is when you're fishing, particularly when in the year if you're if you're a trout fisherman at all you know in spring like in may when you can walk out and you smell that dirt and the worms and everything you're like i need to go over to this brook in this bend and i'm going to catch trout like crazy today in august you don't walk out and smell the heat and say man i need to run over that brook in that bend you're not going to catch nothing i mean the, the water temperature is different the whole brook is different and the trout are acting they may have moved out of that area it's very much the same in the winter in a lake. So, like, uh, I fish I fish Brant Lake a lot. When that thing first freezes, if you think about it, oxygen has been blown in from the surface. The, the weeds are still growing strong because the sunlight is able to penetrate and keep the weeds alive. Those weeds are actually creating photosynthesis that's putting oxygen in the water, and they're holding all the baits that they're eating in those weeds. So you go out there when the lake first freezes and those fish are still excited. They have a lot of oxygen. They have a lot of feed. They're in the shallowers and they are moving and shaking and you can catch them. And then in Brant Lake, I'll fish that for maybe two to three weeks. Usually we'll get a good snowstorm, which will darken the water. All of a sudden the weeds will start flattening down and the fish get lazy and they move out into deeper waters. They're not, it's not that you can't catch fish after that. But it, it's a different lake, basically. What you did before isn't the same. I found there's sometimes these sunken, I'm pretty sure there's spring water. The spring is coming up from the bottom of the lake because there's nothing topographically. It's the same exact bottom, but there's something about this one spot that will hold fish. You pretty much got to find that, read somebody else's drill holes, or just Swiss cheese the lake and find. When you find where those are, you put that in, in your Navionics, and you can fish them. But on Brant Lake... I will fish them like that. I'll, I'll work the, the shores when the first freezes. I'll work out like the second stage, and then I'll leave the lake alone for the rest of the winter because the, the fish are, they're like, they're in just like a coma state almost. Everything, they have to reserve their energy. There's less feed to be had. There's less oxygen to be had. So then I'll pull out of there and I'll go to some of the bigger lakes. Lake George, even Scroon Lake, they tend to freeze later. Some of the Great Lakes or Champlain. The freeze later, so they're actually a little bit further along. They've been oxygenated. There's been uh, better weed life, and they will uh, they'll have more action later in the year. And you can find there's more deep waters in those lakes that the fish are still active in. So the second half of the year, I go out into particularly Lake George, uh, find those kind of spots and work them. Then there's another change. It's happening like the last three or four days. The weather starts to warm up. You get a couple rainy days. You get uh, you get uh, water dripping down through the holes. You know how it looks like a toilet bowl sometimes. The water's flooding down the holes. I've fished down like a whirlwind because there's oxygen 
flowing in there and some warmer, more exciting water. And sometimes a fish will collect right around there. It's hard to feel your bait because the thing's zipping in circles. But I've found that those times you want to go back to some of those smaller lakes because those fish that have been laying around all winter all of a sudden got excited again and there's spots. Eventually, as you as you fish more and you learn those days, it's almost like you can smell where you're supposed to be that day. You can get a feel for how that lake is interacting and, and what's uh, what's going to work. So when where is very important and when is very important. There's another part of when, which is within the daily cycle. I found a fish down in Bolton Landing at the Veterans Park a lot. A lot of people do. This year there was the parking lot, hundreds and hundreds of people out there. But there was a lot of fish out there too. So we got there before daylight, took our headlamps out so we could get a good spot. And I looked up and I counted 350 people in that bay, which is not that big of a bay. And there wasn't nobody moving. They're all sitting on their bucket just cranking fish. You don't, nobody, you don't hear a word. You don't hear nothing. The sun, the sun is like not quite come up, but it's bright enough that the fish are starting to bite. And it's a cold day. And then the sun peaks over top of the mountain and you can hear the ice because the, the sun's heat's actually starting to hit it. And the barometric pressure is starting to change a little bit. And you hear the ice. And all of a sudden, I'm not catching fish anymore. I was cranking them one right after another. And now they stopped. It's like 730 in the morning. And I thought, gee whiz, there's something wrong with me. And I look up and 350 guys are all kicking their buckets around and drilling new holes and poking the fish just plain shut off. And so I look out and I see people that are just getting in the parking lot at 7.30 and they're coming out there like, ah, oh, this bay is terrible. You can't catch a fish here. I'm like, I can, I can fill a bucket <laughs> half an hour ago. So you'll learn that. And that's not, the morning bite is, is consistent in that bay. But I've found in other places, like the morning was, the in the morning, the small ones bit. And after about two o'clock, the big ones bit. So we stopped getting up early, squirrely, and going out with the headlamp. It wasn't it's totally not worth it. You wanted to be there between 2 and 4.30. Uh, so being aware of that, like that, that all these factors are in play, you can start, if you keep a, if you're organized and, and on the ball, you keep a log and actually say, all right, these are the temperatures. These are, I have this uh, barometric pressure, 12 hour historical thing on this little uh, weather module thing. And I have a theory about this barometric pressure that the perch, they have a air bladder like all fish do. That's why they float up when they die. Their air bladder is sealed like a bubble. A pike and a lake trout actually can adjust that air bladder quite easily. A perch and a walleye actually need gases slowly over a few hours to increase or decrease the pressure on that in that air bladder. So if the barometric pressure changes, that's especially if it spikes up, like it was it was fairly even overnight, and then that morning it's getting warmer and the pressure's raising up. You could watch it on that graph. You'll see that it went from 28 to 31, that's like a giant diaphragm, that ice on the lake, pushing down on the water, pushing down on those bladders, and pushing down on the fish. You'll find, I, mean, I get pretty nerdy with this stuff. I've spent way too much time fishing and trying to figure this out. But we, we've got these uh, sonar systems where you can see where the fish are, and you can watch, like almost every day, a glass ceiling sets up on a lake. And you can raise a perch, say he's interested, he follows, he follows, he hits that glass ceiling at, say, three foot or two foot or four foot, depending on the day, and he will not bust through that. And I'm suspicious that it could be that that barometric pressure is in play, and that's what's keeping him uh, from doing that. And so I took this grand concept that I've been studying on for years, and I went to Norm's Bait and Tackle up in uh, uh, Crown Point area, this guy buys and sells perch all year long for 30, 40 years. So I'm like, he's going to know good the difference between good days and bad days. And I sit down with Norm. I'm like, I'm tired of explaining this whole process. And he's like, Roger, he's like, I got to stop it. He's like, I've been seeing fish come in for 40 years. He says, the fish bite when they want to bite, and they don't bite when they don't want to bite. And you're not going to figure out why. <laughs> And there's there's probably a lot of truth to that because I'm pretty sure I've been a, a manipulating my data to try to prove my point. But 
there's definitely been days when when these things seem to work, and there's also days when it's random. But if you keep track of it, uh, you can you can optimize your time, if, especially if you're taking kids, taking new people out, and you fist it the day before, and you know this is, this is a good time, this is a bad time. Try to take the kids out at the what is going to be the best bite in time. So where is important? When is super important? So then there's how, and <laughs> That was uh, was quite a learning curve for me. So I, I told you in the beginning, we, we went up to this Bowacky Bay and we caught thousands of perch every winter. There was no limit on the perch. You could catch buckets of them, and we did. It wasn't hard. It was uh, about 15 foot deep, and it was like this mud, squishy mud bottom, and there was all sorts of bloodworms and stuff in that squishy mud. There was smelt running over it, and there was just a lot of good feed, and the perch were in that stuff like crazy so we'd work out there we'd find where roughly where the, the schools have been hanging out it wasn't quite schools it was more just acres of beds of, of perch and this is what we ended up setting up to catch them with this is insane this is a two ounce ocean fishing lure called a crippled herring it was in a perch color before i beat this thing to death i was talking to kenny i've had this lure for 20 years somehow i haven't lost it to a bigger fish it looked like a perch so you drop that thing to bottom in that mud and bounce it around in that mud. Now you got a little cloud of mud coming up. It looked just, because you're trying to call a fish to you, it looked just like a perch, nose down, poking in the mud, popping up some grubs or some, or not grubs, but nymphs and stuff. That would cause other fish to come in to investigate. We'd use a slip bobber, which runs right up your line until it hits a stopper which that stopper would be just below the surface of the water in your hole. And the whole thing was like, you'd hit bottom, bounce it once or twice, and then let it go dead still. And that bobber would sit in the hole and you'd see the other perch would come in and say, hey, what's this perch into? Oh, that's what he's into. He's hitting these nymphs. Wham, wham, you get one or two fish at a time. You'd see that bobber go, tink, tink, reel them in, repeat process. That's what I could see at night when I went to bed after, after day after day. So effective. It, I mean, there was, it was amazing. So I figured I am a master perch jigger because I can catch them at will. I'm teaching people how to fish. It turns out I taught this one guy, my buddy. I said, here's here's generally what perch fishing is. He went there with me, and he's like, oh, let's go down Lake George. We'll try it. And he got into it, and he bought a Vexlar, and he had the whole thing set up. So I meet him one morning. <laughs> I got my systems. He's sitting. He's got a hole right here. I got my hole right here. I'm dropping down the bottom, watching that bobber. He's catching one. I'm not. He's catching another one. He's He's got a limit of 50. I had two. <laughs> he's like, do you want any help? He caught 98. <laughs> I had two. <laughs> that was very humbling for me. I thought I knew how to fish, but there was minor things he was doing differently that made a big difference. Uh, so the, the philosophy of her jigging what I've discovered is there's a there's a place where perch are happy. That's kind of where they're hanging out zone. And then there's a strike zone. And what my buddy had figured out with his Vexlar, a, a Vexlar is a sonar system that will that will see something the size of a knot on your line at 60 feet down. So he could watch his lure go down. He could watch the fish go up. And he could zero up right into the strike zone where the fish would bite. And he could just repeat that over and over again. So what... What he was doing was super effective. He was watching his lure go down. These fish were hanging out just above the weeds. You'll see, like, even in this in these videos, I've got a lot of underwater footage now of what they're doing. They're hanging out, usually cruising five, six inches above the weeds. Sometimes you'll catch them right there. Sometimes they're so comfortable and happy right there, if you put the lure right in that spot, they're not in any stress. They'll kind of look it over and be like, eh, that's not really a grub. I'm moving. But... If you pull it to this, to, they're happy in those weeds because they can hide if they need to and they can feed. They don't want to rise up too high or a lake trout or pike is going to eat them, or at least they think it's going to. So almost any given day, there's like the strike zone, which is usually five or six inches above or sometimes 10 inches above their cruising zone. And what he was doing was just nailing that every time. So now they get up in that strike zone. They're like, oh, I got to I gotta, I gotta make a decision here. I got to eat this or, or dive back down. 
and you could tease them and get them to whack it and drop or, and, and get them to catch. So I had this thing. I'm dropping this thing that I caught 8 million fish on. I dump it down there. This giant weight is down in the weeds. My first fly is down in the weeds, and my second fly is just above the weeds, right in there, stare at it, but think about it zone. And then I get mad because he keeps catching fish, so I jig, which is, jigging perch is like the worst thing you can do. This whole lifting and dropping, most of the things that they eat don't zoom up and down four feet and a half a second. But I probably had lots of fish coming close and maybe thinking about it. And then I yanked this big lure up through the weeds, which looked a lot like a pike that had been hiding in the weeds, zooming after him. And I scared off fish like crazy. I was doing everything wrong. All I had to do, and I eventually uh, made a fly rig, that's what these things are called, that had an adjustable location for the weight. The, I had to slide this thing in. And I eventually, I, I downsized the weight to about a three-quarter inch uh, bass casting sinker. I dropped that thing down. That weight would just sit in the weeds, and I did not move it hardly at all. I had two flies now up in the strike zone. And instead of jigging like crazy, I started doing stuff like this. Like you drank too much coffee that day, and you were trying to sit still, but you couldn't, which is way more like what those nymphs were doing. And I realized also the bite... The Lake Champlain bite was heavy, strong bite. Those fish were much more aggressive. They're almost a different critter. They were eating smelt and big stuff more often, and they would whack it. The bite out there was like, did that happen or not? Like, it's just a little wiggle. And you have, if you watch it on the video, you have two and a half seconds. They suck it in, they take it, and they throw it back out. And if you're not, like, hyper vigilant on that, you're going to miss those little movements. So I started getting into spring bobbers and a smaller weight, and lifting it up 10 inches. Amazing the difference between 10 inches, and I'm I'm almost matching him, catching fish for fish. Uh, and I was mocking him because he had to pay $600 for his fancy riggity-jiggity to get the lure in the right spot, and I could get it in the right spot quicker. Uh, but eventually, as, as much as I liked mocking him, he was still out fishing me, uh, and I discovered he was... Uh, Depending on the attitude of the fish, sometimes they absolutely don't want anything down below them, and you're you're just not going to catch something if you have that weight down below. So I switched over to these chain jigs, which is a you know it's kind of a lead thing. This looks like a perch, and it has a like a little watch chain and a single hook on it. I'd put a perch eyeball on that, and I'd up above it, I'd still have a fly. If you open up a fish which I've opened up about 1,400 fish this winter, and look in their stomachs, you're mostly going to find tiny stuff, like the size of a of a size 12 fly fish and nymph or smaller. Sometimes it's freshwater shrimp. Sometimes it's these microscopic little plankton things. So a lot of times out there, I'll drop this thing down. I'll wriggle jiggle this bigger lure. If it's on an aggressive day, I'm going to get them a whack on that. Now I've watched so many times on the video, the fish zoom in, they look at that, and, like, and then they see that nymph, and they don't even think about it. Like, that's what, that's, this is trying to convince them to eat Thanksgiving dinner, turkey. This is trying to get them to eat a Dorito. And if you think about all the factors involved, maybe that barometric pressure is pushing on them. Maybe there's, maybe they're just not all that into eating that day, but if you can give them something really small, you can catch them. So a lot of people hear that and they're like, well, I'm going to go buy the smallest tungsten jig head I can find. And that's a good idea a lot of days. But if you're trying to keep a school around in 32 feet of water, it takes you five minutes to work that silly little jig down there. And if you watch on these videos, you'll see if we catch a fish and we don't have another jig down there, we catch a fish, the, the flop of that fish gets them excited. As they come up the water column, they're actually puking out whatever was in their stomach, which is therefore chumming all that stuff back down, and you create a feeding frenzy. Perch are just like teenagers. They get dumber when they're in groups. So your your idea is you're trying to draw them in, you're trying to draw them in and keep their attention. I like to have two people. Like I want to be four or five feet apart and be jigging so that there's almost always a jig down there. And there's days when I have to use tungsten because they're just that picky and I just have to give them like two pound test line 
the lightest looking grub looking thing I can and work in that real careful. But if I can possibly fish something heavier, I'm probably going to catch more fish. I keep that feeding frenzy going. I've found the heavier the weight, the tighter your line is, the more likely you are to see those very microscopic bites. If you think of, you know, you've seen your line when it's, when it's not tense, it often will get those little slinky coils in it. If you've got a little tiny tungsten at the end of there, it, the, the fish bites and pulls a little bit out of the slinky coil and you didn't see, you didn't see that action. So I like to use the heavier uh, stuff. But there's plenty of days. Tungsten jig heads are uh, crazy effective. I've had my buddy do the same thing, totally outfish me. With, he's there using the Vexlar with a tungsten while I'm trying everything else, and he's just killing them with that tungsten because there's just something about that presentation on that day. Tungsten is almost twice as dense as lead. So a little jig. I'll pass these around. We do have time afterwards, too, to come right up and take a look at all these things. But that little thing right there still weighs, I don't know, seven-tenths of a... I'm not even... It's not seven-tenths of an ounce. It's, it's amazingly heavy for what it is, and it's dense. So it's going to still get you down there quicker. It'll give you more tension. I really like spring bobbers, especially for tungstens, or often even for the fly rig, because you can tense that line up. And especially if you're not used to the what you're looking for, that spring bobber shows it to you. These, uh, I found a, a guy out uh, in the Midwest that ma hand makes these spring bobbers, and they have a fluorocarbon loop that your line goes through instead of metal, which makes it so when you reel in, uh, you're not building up ice on a piece of metal. The fluorocarbon's always wiggling, and, and it throws the ice off. I've fished in zero degrees outdoors with that with that spring bobber and and it uh and it reads all day long so i have to talk about the vexlar as much as i i was angry at my buddy and told him he didn't uh, didn't need to invest in it oh, first off it's a lot of fun and second off there's a lot of days you can catch a lot more fish uh vexlar markham there's a few companies that make these sonars the vexlar screen is a weird kind of dial shaped thing i've got some youtube videos too if you look at it I, I i actually explain how you use these things but so you're you watch your line you drop your lure in and you see your lure show up as a strange mark going down this dial and you'll see on the bottom you'll see some weeds and usually if you're in a good spot you're going to see a fish or two which is just a red line or two up <laughs> above the weeds you lower your little green line down and once it gets into this happy zone you see the red line coming up to your green line, and then you tease it ever so slightly away, and then the red line and the green line come together, and you catch a fish. That is not how the Indians did it at all, but it's amazingly effective. My buddy, like he doesn't hardly even look or feel at his jig pole. He has become one with that Vexlar screen enough that he can see when A and B are together and set the hook based on the data he's getting off of that. And if you get good at it, it looks like a bunch of lines and you're like, you're never going to make sense of this at first. Once you get good at it, you can tell the species of the fish. You can tell if the fish turned around. You figure out the aggressiveness of the fish. You can fish the Vexlar on a spot for 10 minutes and you all already kind of know what kind of day you're dealing with, what the, what the attitude of the fish is that day. And you can almost set the Vexlar away and just start blind jigging holes, but you know what you need to do that day to make the fish uh, bite. They do, there, there's a Garmin's now making a cheaper version of a sonar, it's only 200 bucks. And it has, there was a while there where the cheaper ones just weren't reading your smaller stuff, you couldn't see it. That one's actually pretty effective uh, and it can, can get you in. It's also really fun. I know this is a perch jig in class, but lake trout do happen or bigger fish do happen. And on the Vexlar screen, You'll be watching, you got a stack of fish on the bottom, you've been working them, you've been throwing back the little ones and they're coming down sideways and everything. And almost inevitably on Lake George, a lake trout's gonna have to come and investigate what this commotion is going on down there. And if you see a, a lake trout will usually, they're not into this glass ceiling thing, they'll be up halfway up to the surface or whatever. You'll see a red line pop in and you'll see all the little perch red lines drop down into the weeds. And then we pull out 
a, usually a Swedish pimple. It's amazingly effective. You could put a perch eye on it or something to add a little bit of flavor. And you drop that down till you get your red line close to the first red line. And if you see any interest at all in the lake trout, you start reeling. You have to take it away from a lake trout, that, and which is counterproductive. It's not what you would intuitively do with your perch. You have to forget that and turn over. If you stop, it's like, it's like a cat chasing after a toy, and the toy stops, the cat loses interest. You see that red line come up, and you start cranking, 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 and they will, a lot, three-quarters of the time, they will smash that uh, Swedish pimple. And then you clear the lake trout out so you don't have them screwing up your perch chicken. Because they will, I've had lots of days where the, the laker will come in, and now I'm, I'm 10 minutes at least before the perch start biting again because they won't, uh, they won't interact. How many pulls do you take out? Oh, at least 100. Uh, <laughs> I get picked on for not 100, but a ridiculous amount of pulls. Uh, usually, I, I don't like to fish alone, so I like to have four rods myself. I don't change them up. So if there's two of us, I usually have eight rods, which usually means I have one rod conglomeration of lines twisted together. I have to figure out how to keep them separated. but. Yeah, I will. I always have a fly rig. That's a great question. I always have a fly rig ready to go. Most of the, a lot of the time, a fly rig with a heavy weight on the bottom will catch you more fish than anything else. But there's days that's not true. But I always, I, and if it, if it starts heating up, like say I've been dinking around with a, with a tungsten trying to get in a bite and then I'm catching two, three at a time, I throw that tungsten away because I'm, I'm catching, I, I know I could do a lot better with a fly rig. And I don't want to lose a second because they can move on you. So I just drop that rod and I pick up that fly rig and drop that down. So I've always got a fly rig. I've always got something with two pound test and a tungsten and maybe a microplastic on that tungsten. And I've always got this chain jig with the fly up above. And if I go out, usually I start with this thing. With the Vexlar, I start with the chain jig with the fly. I may stay with that all day, uh, or I may switch. Basically, this is the middle of the road. If they're a little bit finicky, you can catch them on this. If they're hammering, you can catch it on it. Uh, this is the middle of the road. If they are absolutely biting, there's no better than this. So this is high test. And then if you got to work them, you switch down to that tungsten. And that's, so that's, that's three rods right there. Then I've usually got I got a Laker rod with eight pound tests ready to go so I can protect myself uh, against their attacks. And then I may have another rod, a backup of each one. I, I, I'll often tend to big balls. <laughs> Excessive for sure. I mean, I got, I got the two man sled to think I usually have about 250 pounds worth of stuff to catch 50 pounds worth of fish, but uh, can't help it. Uh, I do like, uh, if you're fishing outside of a shanty, I would definitely look for a jig pole with the least amount of eyes possible and big holes because you got the ice buildup issue to, to deal with. This rod is a, it's a Berkeley Lightning. I don't know, it's probably a $16 rod. It's a carbon, not a fiberglass. I like carbon better because it transfers the feeling uh, into your fingers. Oh dear, I've already caught, see this is very effective. It will catch almost anything. Uh, if you're digging a hole in the summer, digging a pier hole, you got a shovel in your hand, you're down at the bottom and you thunk against the rock, your fingertips tell you a ridiculous amount of information. You know the size of that rock, how hard that rock is, how much of a pain you got. Somehow God gave us in our fingertips the the data collecting ability that's beyond our brain. Through a through a through a rock, through a shovel head, through the handle, into your fingers, and you've got all that data. If you can harness that and start tweaking that into your fingers, it is amazing how you can uh, uh, just use that for the fish. I don't, like this is the traditional way you hold the jig pole. I almost never hold a jig pole that way. I hold it kind of like a pencil so that I'm engaging the front, those front fingertips that I have that are so amazing. And then I'm also looking out the length of my jig pole and I'm doing this kind of movement. When I hook a fish, th there's a, there's really something to that. I bring people that are new out fishing, and they, they keep catching fish, and they keep losing them before they get to the surface. 
because what we normally do, oh, I got one, I yank it up like this. Uh, Clara, my, my little five-year-old, demonstrates how not to do it really well on, on one of those videos. You yank it up like this, you get all excited, you start reeling, and you lift it up again, you reel it. So you rip the hole in that fish's mouth, then you open the hole up, and then you try to, you're, you're like, you're making the hole bigger and bigger, and then making slack to get the hook out over and over again. And it's quite normal that you lose, especially in Lake George. You got 32 feet. You got to pull that fish. Somewhere along that line, you're going to lose a fish. So the, most people, when they first start fishing, don't even think about that. And I'm watching them, and I'm crying inside because I, I see what they're doing. So I, I'm holding it like this usually. I see that strike. It's a really good idea. And you'll watch this on the video. The perch often quack it somewhere random. And then they take a second bite. Perch are nibblers. They're not like bass. They do this weird little nibble nibble thing. And it is really good idea to watch that first strike and count to two, which I cannot do. But somebody could say, okay, boink. My wife does it way better than I do. You go, okay, there's a hit. Going to give it a second. And then I set the hook. You'll get a lot more fish if you do that. So when I set the hook, I lift it up about that far. And I anchor this rod and hand, and I don't move that again, and I reel steady. And that, you'll catch a lot more fish if you, if you reel fish in that way. Another thing I haven't mentioned much is bait. Uh, all the lures in the world are great. A lot of lures are significantly better than other lures. But perch, I have no idea what science nerd says this or how they can prove it. But perch apparently have... 16 times better sense of smell than a bloodhound, which I think that's just a, whatever, the statistics. We'll all be amazed by it. But fish, perch, and all sorts of fish very much use their sense of smell. And you can have the best looking lure ever that is totally convincing. But if you haven't engaged their sense of smell, you're going to get a lot of fish passing by on that. So I always have a bait. 90% of the time, I have a bait on almost any one of my presentations. Usually, I use a perch eyeball on one, say one fly, the bottom fly of a perch eyeball, and I have a grub or a mousy on the upper fly. If I consistently see the fish keep whacking the mousy and not the grub or the eyeball, I'll switch to two mousies or vice versa. Uh, but it makes a big uh, difference to have bait. Perch eyeballs, that sounds like the grossest thing on earth. Why would you do that? Uh, two reasons. One is nothing lasts longer. They're super leathery. And if you're trying to keep them perch around, you need to have your bait on and get back down there quick. And nothing lasts longer than a perch eyeball. You can catch 50 fish on one eyeball. Second is there's something sick about fish where they like eyeballs. You'll see if you've got a fish tank and your fish died overnight, you look in in the morning, he's missing both his eyeballs because the other little stickos in there ate his eyeballs off. It just, it just, it, there's something about it. That, that perch eyes or, or fish eyes tend to work as good bait. Grubs, I don't put, lots of people put 8, 10, 12 grubs on there. I put one grub on because I've I've watched enough footage, like a football coach or whatever, I've watched enough footage where they, the fish will bite like the the most sticky-outy flange of whatever you're offering, and you'll feel that bite, bite and you'll set the hook, and he didn't take it in his mouth. So I want to keep that thing as small as I possibly can to get them to, to get the whole lure or the whole bait in their mouth. So I use one grub and I catch most of my fish on size 12 hooks with some sort of a nymph fly tied on that hook. Because that's usually, at worst, it's a one bite, two bite. And a lot of times on a good day, it's a one bite and they've wrapped completely around that thing. It's weird, like this super sensitive factor is like, how could that matter? Um, it can matter 98 fish to two someday, some of these little tiny factors. Uh, definitely we have time to take a look at some stuff uh, afterwards too. There's a story, My uh, actually Kenny was out there that day with some of my other friends. We were out and we uh, we were we couldn't find a perch yet. We knew they were roughly on this, this one perch ground and we decided to just put a like a like a deer drive line out. There's six of us or so, and we were all just drilling. And if you didn't catch anything here, we're just working the line and we're drilling every 20 feet. And my buddy's like, notice my wife. Like she's two two sets of lines behind us. I look back and she 
caught one fish and she slid it underneath her bucket when no one was looking. <laughs> she was not sharing that she'd found the school of fish. Uh, and that's, <laughs> that made for a funny time. We all went over there. We, we heckled on her a little bit and then we all limited out on that spot because she'd found the spot. I mean, so we've gone over the where's and the when's, but it's really important. Why are you fishing or why are you doing anything that you're doing outdoors? If you're not into it to share it with other people, you're going to just end up frustrating yourself and go down a, a rabbit hole you don't want to be down. Uh, I love, like, the other beautiful thing, like, if you're into brook trout fishing, you get really good at that. You don't want to share your spots because there's not that many brook trout in the pond and they're going to get fished out. Perch benefit from heavy fishing pressure. Like, these bays where I'm getting this footage, thousands of feet people are catching fish there 350 guys in one bay in one day and they're and they're catching a lot of them are catching their limit of 50 perch for six eight weeks and last year i mean that was going on last year and i went out with a canoe to get on the ice and i could still limit out like they hadn't fished the perch out not that not that that's impossible but perch benefit from fishing pressure so it's a great thing if you learn how to catch perch to share it. Kids enjoy it because you're catching a bunch of fish and it just gets people back outdoors and away from, well, they're away from some of their electronics and then I teach them about new electronics, but uh, it's a great opportunity to, to share uh, an outdoor activity, to sit in a bucket and to laugh with each other. My grandfather, I mean, he was a big fisherman and hunter and everything. And I remember sitting in his house one day and he just told me like two or three great stories and he's like, man, like if I could see the pile of game that I've caught and shot over the years, oh, and my father's there, he's like, that'd be a pretty stinky pile by now. <laughs> really, when it comes down to it, like catching one more fish or catching a bigger fish or putting up another cool picture on Facebook of what you can do and nobody else can, it's not good for anybody. Getting into fishing and sharing it and learning from each other and then enjoying like fish, perch are really good eating too. That's what the, I would say. If that if you set that as your why, as far as why you're fishing, you're gonna have a lot more fun, and you're gonna uh, help other people to have more fun too. There's a lot of good content on YouTube right now, but there's probably more to life going out and doing stuff. Uh, so that's that's the majority of what I'd like to talk about. I'd love to have any questions or you know take a look at stuff. Uh, that's uh, that's what we got time for. That day you're talking about, you mean veterans parks? Yeah, yeah, veterans. You get bucks out of there? I last year I took twelve hundred perch out of there. No kidding. Yeah, it's uh, veterans is for for as accessible as it is. It is crazy accessible. There's a giant public parking lot there, which this year was full to the point people were parking in a, a, a another access parking and getting ferried down in there. Thousands of people fishing there. Not that. I mean, if you can find a spot where nobody goes, you're going to do better. But there's we kids. We perch used to there. big perch off the East Good Town Dock there. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we were catching perch in the summertime just with worms. Yep. And that used to be an old sawmill. A lot of that stuff out there was that's where they dumped that, the They call it Sawmill Bay. Yeah, and there's there's still big flats of that stuff that won't even grow uh, uh, weeds in it. And you know, you're not always going to get it like this year. This guy watched my YouTube stuff. Really neat guy. He's from Canada and he's moved down by New York City. He's like, I always ice fish and I can't now. He, would you would you just show me how to do it? I'm like, yeah. I'm, I'd, I'd taken at that point. I'd taken 400 fish. I'd limited every time I'd gone to sawmill. I was like, come on up, get there early because it's an early bite. So he got up there like two o'clock that morning. He drove up there. I could not get them fish to bite. So we caught nine perch in like ten. We fished till 11 o'clock. We got nine perch, and I could not make it happen. And finally, I'm like, I'm sorry, but I got I to gotta go. I mean, you can try try further out. I show him the Navionics and everything. And he sent me an email like two hours later. He's like, I got out further? He says, I found one of them humps. And he's like, limited. I was so happy that I mean, after all he put in. And he went out the next day, he limited. So, but it gets squirrely. They don't always hold up on... On one spot out there, there'll be pods, maybe two, three hundred perch, and they'll be moving. And you can either chase them or you can get into one of the spots where they tend to go and just jig like crazy when they go through. 
and then enjoy another 10 minutes. And when they come back through again, you can jig like crazy. But yeah, you can catch. Well, I'm, uh, Grand Lake up there by the Paradise Road there. Yeah. I had uh, Rainbow Snow come through there. Yeah. The, just like it. The cam, uh, the next are just supposed to... Yep, you can't see it from top to bottom. The smelt, yep, the smelt will do that, and the perch uh, in some places will do that too. Crappy will do that. They'll get bound, bound up in those groups. What's your best bar uh, barometric pressure? Steady. Uh, best barometric pressure, I would say, even if it's high, I'd like it to have been the same mm -hmm. yesterday and today and going to be the same tomorrow. Or dropping. It makes sense. So whatever they, whatever they got, their body has a, gotten static with, they're more likely to be active. Again, this is a theory. It's not proven. Or like it's been around 30 and it looks like it's going to drop because there's a, there's a rainstorm, snowstorm coming in. A lot of people are like, that's always when you want to get there. Boy, I haven't found that to be always the case. But I really like, even if it's high, if it's been bright and sunny for three days in a row, I, I feel okay with that, even if it's 31 inches barometric pressure because they've figured that out. But you'll have to figure that day. Oh, that's one thing. I'm glad you asked that question. So if you don't have the sonar and you're and, and the the fly rig with that weight on the bottom adjusting that height isn't working, there's another great trick. Take your jig pole, lower it to where you've been catching. So lower it to your hip bottom, lift it up. Say you even got a nibble, you're like, okay, that's that's the spot. It's right there. That's the strike zone. On almost every jig or every reel they have this little clip on it it was so people fishing canals could set the clip and cast and it would stop the lure on the other side you can set your line in that clip i do this a lot. i had this bucket ready to show you how that works you set your line in that clip right where those fish are biting and you uh you catch a fish you reel it up you don't have to think or feel or try to if you drop, drop it into weeds, you might pick up weeds when you got to lift up again. You've got it on that clip. The line just goes down to the end of the to the end of the spool to hit that clip. Stops right there. You put it on the bucket like this, and you are right every time. You're right in there, and you didn't pay six hundred dollars for a Vexar to do it. And a lot of times, I'll put it on the bucket, and this is my jigging. I bounce it just like that, just a little bit of a wiggle, and I'm right in that happy zone. I, I bet you I get. Half the fish I catch in the winter, uh, uh, the jig pole is sitting on a bucket. Partially also because I can't wait two seconds after I see the fish bite, and the having it on the bucket causes me a little bit of a delay there. Another thing I didn't mention, I was talking about uh, looking for the fish. I had a hand auger for a million years, and I heard that you could use electric drill, but I didn't believe it until I finally cobbed this thing up with a wacky noodle and a piece of rebar. It is amazing. 18-volt drill, put it in first gear, 40 holes out of this. And that allows you to cover a lot more water. And another big thing, like if you're fishing, if you're fishing in the summer, you go out, you anchor your boat, you cast out, you catch a perch, you cast out again, you catch another perch. You do not sit on the same anchor when you're fishing in the summer for three hours and say, what well, a fish stop biting. Well, of course, it's, you've got to move. And you'll find uh, if you've got if it's easier to drill your hole with an electric drill, boy, you can zip around and and uh, cover a lot more ground. Just think about it as cast. You're covering so much more. La two days ago, we we did good. We caught a hundred perch. But if you had sat on the same hole, basically the first come in, you'd catch three or four, and then you caught the easy ones, or they started to catch on to what was going on, and they all just started backing off. So I just went around, I drilled, not in a whole big area, but every 12 feet, 15 feet, I just punched, punched, punched a bunch of holes, and we were just going from one hole, drop it, put it on the bucket, boop, boop, boop. I caught four fish, it stopped down, I, and I didn't, I bet you I was five minutes on a hole, boing, 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 keep working and coming back around. Really effective uh, uh, method. But finding a, that electric auger, I had a guy sleeping in the front row when I was doing this class once, <laughs> which is fine, because it's it's tiring, <laughs> but I pulled this thing out, and his son was next to him. He was like, Dad, wake up. Look at that. And I wish I had seen this years ago. I've destroyed my shoulder for no good at all. It, it hasn't. Yeah, I've used the same. The ion electric? I, ion electric's better, but it's 600 bucks, and this, you know. Good that. Yeah, it's really 
just as good. What size rebar did you use? Uh, that was five eighths rebar. Into those. Just into jam. Those. Well, I got an extender thing on here. You can actually. They make the adapter. I'm so cheap. It's like eighteen bucks you buy the adapter, but I'm too cheap to do that. Yeah, yeah. The rebar. And this has its own custom look to I it. I used a uh, half inch EMT electrical conduit. Yeah. Mine. That would work. Yeah. So the the only challenge is if it drops out of the chuck, you lose it down the hole. That's which so is, challenging. <laughs> So they they solved that with some of them by putting this crossbar thing so it wouldn't catch. Go. No, that's not a good idea because right there is where this crossbar is swinging, and I don't really want that to happen. So uh, so I just found that this is a pipe wrap or a wacky noodle or something just to make it mm -hmm. so it floats. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. How do you determine what size hole you're using? I mean, obviously, if you're going after smaller fish, it's a smaller hole, but like, yeah. do you ever take a what size hole? If I'm using tip-ups, I usually use a seven or eight inch hole. I don't fish tip-ups all that much, but that would be what I'd use. This is a five inch, which is a significantly better than a four inch, uh, especially because we catch Lakers. I've caught 10 pound fish out of a five inch hole. They squeeze a little bit, but it will work. So I really like five inch. You know, the smaller it is, the faster you drill. If you can drill more holes, get, you know, more energy out of your, out of your battery. Uh, if I know, if I was crappy fishing, which crappy fishing is like a different game and you're not moving around as much, I'll take my bigger auger because crap, you're such a pain in the neck uh, uh, that you want that bigger hole to, to work with. But most of the time it's five minutes. How much time do I have? Are we... Yeah, so we have way more time for an hour. Well. Yeah. So you I got can... time as well. Oh, okay. Uh, well, what have you heard about these? I bought one. They're cleaned out in the area. They still... Uh, Oh, I, I've seen them, but I haven't. Uh, I mean, that's going to work. Like, lake trout want to see something moving. Pike, even, too, that flash of moving. Perch, I, you know, that, in my experience, those big jumpy actions, someday it might work most of the time. That That's just going to spook them away, or, you know, you're not going to engage with them. I've used the jaw jackers. They're all right. Uh, I wanted to mention real quick, crappy fishing or slow perch fishing. I didn't set a jig pull up for it. I've found uh, you have a bunch of fish. If you have a sonar or something, you see a bunch of fish. They're coming in. They're looking at your lure, and they're they're swimming away with a piece of your soul. Uh, and crappy do that a lot. And part of that is where, where there's crappy, there's usually a million people fishing them. And they have an eyeball the size of you, and they they they're smarter fish. They come in, they look at it like that is a jig. I know what happens here, and I move on. <laughs> so I watched this. I actually learned this on YouTube. This guy was jigging a hole with a with an active like a tungsten or something, and four or five feet away, he had a little tiny minnow on a small treble hook on a slip bobber, and I found it really effective to. I call it the side show because your main event is in the center, and that's what's drawing the fish in. But you, five to one, the, especially crappy, they come in, they look at that, like, oh, I know better than that. They go over, like, this is what I've been looking for. I got I got four-pound test fluorocarbon line on that with the tiniest treble hook and just a clean minnow swimming around. And that slip bobber, which allows so that when they bite it, it doesn't give them any tension. And it's amazing, five to one on a, on those weird slow days. I've done it with perch too, and I keep seeing them coming in. And I just have that little, I mean, the smallest minnow you can find, because again, everything is the smaller, the more bites you're going to get. And you'll see that bobber just, if it's a if it's a crappy, a lot of times the bobber will pop up out of the hole, so it'll stink. And you know, I demonstrate that too on on YouTube. Any other questions? Or ideas? Much. Yeah. If you want to uh, take a look at anything up close, uh, ask any other questions. We've got the, we've got a little bit of time before our lunch session. After lunch, I'm doing a class on wireline fishing, uh, trolling this wireline.